Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 through 40, which can be found on page 75 in your pew Bible. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had not known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Christ. Well, if you are a visitor to Westminster, I'm sure you wondered very quickly this morning, what in the world is a Catholic priest doing as preacher at Westminster? Well, Westminster, we go way back, don't we? <laughs> you know you're old, when you happen to be staying where your mother lives. Of course, you know where she lives. She lives at the Waterford. She doesn't live in the, the home where I grew up. And I'm staying in one of the guest rooms. And this morning, I'm walking out of the door. And the woman in the apartment across from me is walking out of the door. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to scare the you-know-what out of her. She's never seen me before. I'm, and she looks at me. She goes, oh, are you moving in? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, no, I'm here visiting my mother. And she said, oh, that's nice. And she just walks right in her door. And I'm thinking to myself, surely she's blind. <laughs> or at least her eyesight is really, really bad, I hope. Oh, what, what, it was funny. It was funny. I want you to think for a moment has anyone ever thrown you a surprise party? Yeah? A few of you in here. No, one, no one's ever thrown me a surprise party. I think for two reasons. As a child, I think I was too precocious, and I would have figured it out. And most of you, many of you know that's true because I grew up here. As an adult, I'm, I'm what they call a high sensate. I notice everything. I notice when people get haircuts. I notice when people have a new pair of glasses on. So I think my friends probably figure that I'm such a high sensate that if they tried to pull the wool over my eyes, it just wouldn't work. So no one, so I, have, I don't have the experience of ever being surprised. But I have surprised people before. One successful moment was when my mother turned 80 years old. About, what's that, 15 years ago? <laughs> no, it was just six years ago. We threw her a little birthday party. Many of you were involved in that because we had a gathering at the church on Sunday. Well, on Friday night, 
I don't know if you know this or not, we had a lot of friends and family come in from out of town, and I took mom out. I said, she knew something was happening, but I said, we're just, we're going to leave for the day, and we drove down as far as we could without going too far, because her birthday's in April, and we saw some wildflowers, and we had lunch together, and it was a really nice day, and we get back to the house. Little, little did she know that my cousin, Margaret Jean, who happens to be here this morning, and some of my other cousins were preparing a large meal for all of the out-of-town guests, and she didn't know who those guests were. So she walked in the door and she saw friends from Wichita Falls and Austin and Kansas, and it was a great surprise. And it was fun to, to do that. So if you've ever experienced a surprise party, you know what a great experience that can be. One story I will tell you about surprising someone else is when I taught school. And many of you know I taught second grade in San Antonio. And um, they're not, you know, most, most second, year, second graders are not used to having a male teacher. So... The boys in class are not used to the teacher walking in the bathroom. And um, so that was one of my favorite things to do when you would send little boys off to the bathroom. And when they'd been there too long, you know, the, the female teacher would usually, like I did with the little girl, she'd kind of knock on the door. They hear the knock, they know it's the teacher, and they kind of wrap things up. But you don't know what they're doing in the end because they could be like a playground on the inside. <laughs> so the fir one of the first days of school, I had a little boy named Marcus. I'll never forget Marcus. Ever will I forget Marcus. <laughs> Marcus probably hasn't forgotten me either, but I just, I just walked right into the boys' bathroom, and there was Marcus on the floor, on his belly, slithering like a snake <laughs> underneath all of the, the stalls. And I simply stood. I didn't say a word. I just simply stood there. He's, he's on his stomach, and he looks up, and he sees me, and the look on his face was priceless <laughs> because I surprised him and I simply looked at him and I said, in the classroom now. Well, he was in big trouble. He knew he was in big trouble. He was in trouble the rest of the year. But it was a great story of surprising someone when they least expect it. Now, let's transition to the gospel we just heard. In the gospel today, Jesus wants his followers to be ready. Jesus does not want his followers to be surprised. That's the last thing Jesus wants, is the, his followers to be surprised when he comes again. Now, the interesting thing is, Jesus is speaking in the gospel today, and he's already foreshadowing his second coming. Because he's talking, when the Son of Man comes again, you better be ready. And he launches into one of his parables that he does so well. When he wants to explain something or get his point across, he goes into a parable. He tells a story. Sometimes Jesus' followers understand the parable, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes we have trouble understanding Jesus' parables, and sometimes we don't, and sometimes we do. Well, here's the parable he gives today. He tells the story of the master that comes back after his wedding. And he says, all of the slaves have prepared for his coming. So when the master knocks at the door, they need to be ready to open the door and come in. And the, the master and his new bride comes in, and everything is laid out, and they knew, they knew exactly what to do when he arrived. And Jesus makes it clear, if, they, if the master comes back and they're not ready then we've got a problem. We've got a major problem. So the question that begs to be answered is, how do you and I become ready for the second coming of Jesus? Well, part of the challenge and part of the problem is we've been waiting for 2,000 years. And when you've been waiting for a long time for a particular event, what naturally happens? We become complacent. It's the most natural thing that we can do. We look forward to a date, and if it's way off in the future, we just kind of forget about it. They thought Jesus' return was imminent. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. They thought Jesus was going to return right away after he ascended into heaven. So when those Gospels were written after Jesus' ascension, it it was an emergency in some ways. By the time Luke wrote his gospel, 
which was after Matthew and Mark, it was pretty evident that Jesus' return wasn't going to happen tomorrow. So it became a quiet expectation instead of such an, an emergency feel that yes, he's coming back, and yes, you need to be ready, but it's not quite as important as Matthew and Mark might have thought. But he still told us that Jesus would come back. And he still said, you need to have your lamps lit, as the choir just sang to us. In other words, you got to be ready. So how do we get ready? What do we do in our own lives in today's world to make sure that we are ready for the second coming of Jesus? Now, what happens if we pass from this life and we go on to our eternal reward in heaven and Jesus hasn't come back yet? Well, then God's going to look at us and say, nice job, good and faithful servant. You prepared for the second coming. Even though it didn't happen in your lifetime, you did what I asked you to do. You prepared. You kept your lamps lit. But, my dear friends, just in case he makes it back while we're still alive, which if you take a look at the world today, it would be no surprise if he did. So let's think about what we have to do to prepare ourselves for the second coming. You go back to the beginning part of the gospel, and if I had to title this sermon, this homily, it would be exactly this line. Where your treasure is, is also your heart. Now think about that for a moment. Where your treasure is, is also your heart. In other words, if our treasure is our job, we're not prepared. If our treasure is being judgmental, then we're not prepared. If our treasure is refusing to help others and not be a servant like God has asked us to do, then we are not prepared. If, even though we say we're not, we're a little bit racist from time to time, then we are not prepared. If we refuse to love somebody, we're not prepared. If we refuse to forgive somebody, we're not prepared. If we decide to gossip instead of keeping our mouth shut, we are not prepared. So to be prepared, we instead start doing the things that are of God, that is loving and forgiving and being in service to one another and making the decision not to gossip, all of those things. But here, here's the deal. When we think of the word treasure, we think of riches, right? And when we think of riches, what do we like to do with that? Yeah, right here. This is my treasure, right here. I'm not going to give my treasure away. This is my treasure, and you can't have it. He doesn't converse with his wife or his children or his workers, and he doesn't converse with God either. He makes the decision on his own to build a bigger barn to hold all of his stuff. He, makes, he builds a bigger barn to hold his harvest. And then God makes an appearance to him, and God says, you fool. Now, I've got news for you. If God ever speaks to you and begins the conversation with, you fool, you've got a problem. <laughs> I'm just saying. If God starts with, you fool, we are in trouble. And he said, who's going to take all this stuff when you're gone? It's the same. That gospel relates perfectly to this gospel. What do we do with our treasure? We don't become hoarders. We don't selves. We learn to be extravagant with God's gifts. Whatever he has blessed us with, we give it away. So if someone approaches you and needs unconditional love, be extravagant with God's love. If someone approaches you and needs forgiveness, no, you don't forgive them just seven times. 
We do what Jesus says, 70 times 7. We are extravagant with God's forgiveness. If someone approaches us and we need to serve them, we need to be in service to them, then we become extravagant with our service. If someone comes to us, we, not, we may not like the way they look. We may not like the way they worship. Here's my favorite one. We may not even like the way they vote. <laughs> but you still become extravagant. We have no choice. Jesus didn't say, I want you to label everybody by the way they look and the what they do and how they vote. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus wants us to be extravagant with every single thing we've been blessed with. And that is love. And that is forgiveness and mercy. Who told us to become hoarders of Jesus' gifts? And that's hard. Most of us, whether you are a Presbyterian or a Catholic or a Methodist or an Episcopalian or a Lutheran or a Baptist, it's hard. Jesus never said it would be easy, y'all. In fact, Jesus said it was going to be hard. It was going to be difficult. I'm going to ask a lot of you. That's what he told us. And if we're not prepared, when the master comes again, we're going to look very silly. Have you seen the bumper sticker that said, God is coming soon? Look busy. <laughs> God is coming soon. Just don't look busy. Be busy. Be busy about the matters of the kingdom. Be extravagant and busy. Give your love away. Give your forgiveness away. Give your respect away. Give your inclusion away. Give your service away. And then, my dear friends, we will know that we are prepared for the coming of the Savior. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join in singing number 262, God of Ages, whose almighty hand.